Don't ask a man what he believes. Ask him, what does he eat? So guys, welcome to this video. Today we're going to be talking about Carl Jung's word association test and psychological complexes and sub-personalities. So, let's get into it. The word association test. Okay, so Jung would, um, he helped develop this test. He also uh, was called upon for criminal cases uh, by judges difficult on for difficult cases to come in and apply this test to them. He also used this test um, on some of his patients. Uh, so here we go. So this is what the word association test is and how you administer it. So you read out well-known list of um, stimulus words. So probably about a hundred words of various different uh, well-known words. Uh, then you instruct the test person to instantly reply with a response to each word. So for example, I say knife and you say, I don't know, bomb. I say pig, you say chicken. I say home, you say door, you know, and so um, then what happens is, is you mark the response time of the test person. So the, the person um, is responding to these test stimulus, uh, stimulus, the word stimulus uh, in a certain amount of time, right? And then, so you, then what you do is then you track how long it takes them to reply to each word and you record all their answers to each uh, word stimuli and then you repeat then you get them to then you repeat the word stimuli you go back through all 100 words and then you get them to repeat their answers that they originally uh, gave you right so that's how you administer the word association test okay and then you record the reaction time to the stimulus words um, the first time and the second time. Now, what are you actually looking for when you're doing the word association test? We're looking for what Jung calls complexes. So Jung actually developed that terminology, the terminology of a complex, right? And here he describes it as you are probing for a word to hit on a person's complex. A conglomeration of psychic contents characterized by a peculiar or perhaps painful feeling tone. Something that is usually hidden from sight. So the key words there are feeling, the, the feeling tone, right? A complex is an agglomeration of associations. A sort of picture of a more or less complicated psychological nature. Sometimes of traumatic character sometimes simply of a painful and highly toned character, okay? So it's an agglomeration of associations, right, um, that have feeling tones. And so I guess that those associations uh, string together through tones of feeling, right? So whatever has an intense feeling tone is difficult to handle because such contents are somehow associated with psychological reactions, with the processes of the heart, of tonus of the blood vessels, the condition of the intensity, um, the condition of the intestines, the breathing, and the innervation of the skin. So basically he is talking about how these feeling tones um, are, an, uh, are built out of associations of, of feelings and that then they are rooted in the physiology, in the body somehow, right? And he explains it well here. Whenever there is a high tonus, it is just as if that particular complex had a body of its own, as if it were localized in my body to a certain extent, and that makes it unwieldy. Because something that irritates my body cannot be easily pushed away because it has its roots in my body and begins to pull at my nerves. 
Something that has little tonus and little emotional value can be easily brushed aside because it has no roots. So he's trying to ground the psychology he's talking about, the complexes, in a physiology, in uh, the body. So it's very kind of so it's kind of Darwinian in that sense. That leads me to something very important: the fact that a complex with its given tension or energy has the tendency to form a little personality of itself. It has a sort of body, a certain amount of its own physiology. It can upset the stomach. It upsets the breathing. It disturbs the heart. In short, it behaves like a partial personality. So you can see there um, that it's like these, the complexes are these feeling tones of associations that are grounded in real estate within the body. So you can picture it as these little personalities have their own, take up their own real estate within your body, within your physiology. And so that's a powerful concept. And, and this is why I think um, Jordan Peterson says that when you read Jung, it becomes to get a bit scary because you realize, wow, actually that is true. There are certain parts of me that are psychologically, um, not only psychological, but there's parts of my psychology that are rooted deep in my body. The, the psych the psychological complexes have parts of my body, right? So that, that I don't even have control over, that are unconscious. And so there's multiple sub-personalities is a, is a really good way to think of it. You know, so uh, the way I respond to sex or say sexual fantasies, that might have an actual grip those feeling tones associated to my sexuality or, or a certain fantasy I have might have a grip within my actual physiology that's um that's and and that complex that psychological complex of feeling tones is able to express itself through my physiology um, without me being conscious of it and so I might be able to um, become conscious of that but nonetheless, I still have no willpower or control over the physiological real estate that that complex um, has hold over in my body. Okay, so uh, here he's really grounding the psychological complexes as sub-personalities that are rooted in the body. And so it's interesting if you go watch a lot of Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning lectures, he uh, talks about um, this type of thing. Right, and so go watch that if you're interested. For instance, when you want to say or do something and unfortunately a complex interferes with this intention, then you say or do something different from what you intended. You were simply interrupted and your best intention gets upset by the complex, exactly as if you had been interfered with by a human being or by circumstances from outside. Under those conditions, we really are forced to speak of the tendencies of complexes to act as if they were characterized by a certain amount of willpower. So that summarizes what I was just saying before. And so these complexes or sub-personalities have kind of a willpower of their own, a consciousness of their own. Uh, and, and that's when you you naturally think about the ego, right? Jung um, basically says that the ego is a complex. It's the complex that we hold dear to our heart because it's the ultimate complex, in a sense, of our consciousness, okay? But um, it's interesting because our, 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 high, our entire psyche is actually not just one thing. We aren't just our ego. We're not just the complex of our ego. There's multiple, we're, mo we're made up of multiple complexes and these complexes may have even their own um, motivations, their own consciousness, so to speak, that are in direct contradiction to our ego complex, our ego consciousness. So we relate everything to our ego um, because that's what we're conscious of, uh, but we we might not understand that deep underneath our ego is actually something else going on. And that's why at the beginning of the video I said, um, 
don't ask what a man believes. Ask what does he eat, right? Because your ego may believe in something. It may rationalize something, right? A set of beliefs built on um, a priori propositions or axioms, right? And then so you believe in that with your rational through your rational mind. Your ego, right, has grab hold of these arguments and, and um, rational um, rationalizations of things. But underneath that, there might be an emotional um, complex or feeling tones that have a very different sinister motivation that are actually driving you to rationalize what you're rationalizing in your consciousness. But you're very unconscious of these motivations that hide underneath your conscious intentions that you've rationalized right so that's where kind of um depth psychology uh kind of shows that rationality is sitting up here on the top it's a thin layer on top of this unconscious processes that are underneath these complexes and and even these um these archetypal complexes so to speak as well when you get deep down into um, the base of the mythological collective unconscious psyche. And so um, what else there is? So we're going to move on here. The complexes and subpersonalities. So we like to think that we are one, but we are not. Most decidedly not. We are not really masters in our house. We like to believe in our willpower and in our energy and in what we can do. But when it comes to a real showdown, we find that we can do it only to a certain extent because we are hampered by those little devils, the complexes. Complexes are autonomous groups of associations that have a tendency to move by themselves, to live their own life apart from our intentions. I hold that our personal unconscious, as well as the collective unconscious, consists of an indefinite, because unknown, number of complexes or fragmentary personalities. Carl Jung, baby. I love that quote. As soon as I read that quote, I just thought, oh my God. Like, there is so much to personal development. Like, it is so deep that um, it's actually amazing that people don't teach this kind of thing. You know, like, when you think of personal development, you think, oh, I want to achieve my goals or I want to, you know, kind of, be more disciplined or something like that. It's like, yeah, how about trying to synthesize and um, and really get your house in order as far as getting these sub-personalities to kind of integrate and work together so I can live a normal life, you know, so I can actually aim at what I'm aiming at because how do I know that what I'm aiming at is really what I want when, I, when I've got all these different um, sub-personalities with their own willpower, their own kind of consciousness, so to speak, fighting against each other. And that's where uh, Jordan Peterson's work, if you go back to even his 2015 Maps of Meaning lectures, lecture one, he talks about kind of, um, you know, dealing with setting a vision for, for who you want to become or where you want to go, and then dealing and integrating all the different parts of your personality uh, through the confrontation, the willing the willing confrontation of um, the unknown, of the dragons, of the danger of the unknown, right? And, and then transforming yourself uh, through the interaction uh, with the unknown. So it's the border between order and chaos moving forward to achieve your goals, the vision that you have uh, for your future. And it's continuously creating yourself, so to speak, with your words, with your language, with very precise articulation. And that articulation is like a psychoanalytic tool and process that you go through if you write down your goals, write down who you are, write down your past experiences and filter through things, through your feelings and you're basically working through your complexes, trying to integrate them, trying to um, kind of deal with them and sort them out. Cleaning up your room is really psychologically getting your house in order. So Jung here, says that we're really not masters of our own house. And, and that's true, we're not, really. Um, but 
that's why Jung has the process of individuation. And so you're actually um, in a process of becoming a true individual uh, by integrating the different fragmentary parts of uh, the unconscious into consciousness. And so you're not just the ego, but you're a fully integrated uh, self, so to speak. So we'll get into that in the future, but it's really applicable to what Jung is talking about here because these are some of the best lines that I think outline what he's aiming at, what he's trying to convey to us is these complexes, these subpersonalities are rooted in the body. They have real estate in the body. They really impact our life. And that's why we use things like the word association test, dream analysis, and uh, active Im imagination, because we're trying to actually discover what these complexes are. But not just the complexes, what, what's going on in the unconscious. And so at various levels, because he says here, uh, I hold that our personal unconscious, as well as the collective unconscious, consists of indefinite number of complexes or fragmentary personalities. So there's, um, at different levels of depth psychology, so to speak, we can get at these complexes. And so um, I think that um, this is forms a very good basis for understanding the rest of Jung's um, work as well. Okay, so the complexes then are partial or fragmentary personalities. When we speak of the ego complex, we naturally assume that it has a consciousness because the relationship of the various contents to the center. In other words, the ego is called consciousness. But we also have a grouping of contents about a center, a sort of nucleus in other complexes. So we may ask the question, do complexes have a consciousness of their own? If you study spiritualism, you must admit that the so-called spirits manifested in automatic writing or through the voice of a medium do indeed have a sort of consciousness of their own. So he's mentioning this because, not because he believes that these are actual spirits coming from these mediums. He's mentioning this because it's almost as if people who are practicing spiritualism are tapping into the psychological components within their own psyche um, and expressing, bringing into consciousness the complexes that um, are otherwise unconscious. And the reason he posits that is because the contents of the, the contents of the words they use, of the context that arises out of, um, say, this automatic writing or something like that, when you analyze it, it definitely um, seems as if it has a consciousness in and of itself that's different from the ego consciousness of the, the reader or the speaker or the writer. And so um, that's, that's, where he, that's why he's talking about um, subpersonalities and complexes having their own consciousness, okay? And so... Uh, he also mentions that because that information is very useful for when we do dream analysis. Now, I'm not going to go over dream analysis here, but I'm going to do that in a future video on dream analysis because it's a big topic. Uh, but I really wanted you to understand complexes, subpersonalities, and, um, and you know, I put the word association test in there because it's a pretty easy thing to understand, right? Okay, and so... Um, Yes, yes, so they have a willpower of their own and um, yes, so also Jung mentions that there's a certain type of yoga training that actually splits up consciousness into its different components and so he's using a um, like comparative religion to show that there were these psychological techniques for dealing with complexes in the past rooted in various traditions, in the yoga tradition here. Um, and so I think that that's very powerful. And um, yes, and so consciousness is actually an illusion, really. Like the, the fact we only have one 
consciousness is an illusion because there's many um, figures that uh, exist and have their own type of willpower, so to speak, within our psyche. And Jung talks about um, personification. So personifying these different influences within the unconscious psyche. When you personify them, you're actually bringing them into consciousness. That's personifying the unconscious figures or the unconscious subpersonalities means that you are now integrating those components of the unconscious into your consciousness. And this is where he's kind of talking, and that's why it's good for dream analysis. That's also why, because in your dreams, you can um, personify certain figures in your dreams. And also when he talks about active imagination, you can train yourself to actively personify these subpersonalities, and then that means you can you can talk with them. That means you can um, deal with them. You can actually communicate with them and uh, integrate them into yourself properly, into your psyche properly. And so it's almost as if you're you are made up of multiple people. And if you get to the point where you can personify each personality, then you can have a conversation, and then you can negotiate and work together. And that's the process of individuation. Of, of dealing, that's how you deal with the different complexes. Instead of ignoring them, pretending you don't have these other motivations, you you uh, you realize you have them, you admit you have them, you personify them, say as the shadow or like an evil shadow, and then you 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 bargain with your shadow, you talk with your shadow, you um, you talk with the personification of that subpersonality within you, so it doesn't just take control of you. So then you actually have control over it. And so um, that's the psychological process that Jung's talking about here. And that's why he mentioned yoga, because it seems that that's what they did, is, is, is what um, Jung is talking about. And so this personification process, Jung notes, actually happens um, in poetry a lot, uh, or in with great artists when they create um, their characters or, or write their characters in story format. Even though the artists themselves won't say that their characters are have a psychological meaning, we know that the fact that they had an imagination that created these characters um, means that they actually, um, these characters come from the subpersonalities of the writer or of the artist. And so they the act of creating these types of um, fictional works is active, actually the act of personification, of pers personifying the, the unconscious subpersonalities and complexes that the writer or artist has. And so that's why these stories are often very powerful and resonate with us because it's tapping into those deeper layers of the psyche. Okay, so how can we tell that we've hit on a complex? The prolongation of the reaction time is the greatest practical importance. You decide whether the reaction time is too long by taking the average mean of the reaction times of the test person. Okay, so we're back into uh, the word association test here. Okay, so we're trying to hit on a complex using the word association test. And so you've got the average mean of the response times and um, you can um, infer from those response times uh, whether something's up. Basically, whether we need to look into that. Um, it's like a flag. Oh, this person took a long time to respond to that particular word. What does that mean? You know, and then you go and look at that word and, and try to contextually draw out a meaning from it. Okay, so other disturbances to look out for while the test patient is um, answering in giving responses towards your word stimuli is reaction with more than one word against the instructions, uh, mistakes in reproduction of the word, facial expressions, laughing, movement of the body, coughing, stammering, and such responses, insufficient reactions like yes or no, not reacting to the real meaning of the stimulus word, habitual use of the same words, use of foreign languages, total lack of reaction, so things like that, you're looking at all these different disturbances and you're analyzing them all and seeing how the person responds, right? So you kind of 
You're really psychologically analyzing them. How are they responding? What does it mean that they they keep ignoring um, to respond on certain words? Or what does it mean that they stammered when um, um, these three certain words were said? You know, and then you kind of try to create a story out of those things and 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 try to come to a conclusion. So, so you're putting different pieces of information together. Okay. So all these reactions are beyond the control of the will. So these reactions from the test person uh, are just automatic. They're gonna laugh or they're, they're gonna move or twitch or scratch, scratch themselves or, or stutter or um, you know, blurt out certain information. The, it, it's just at the, um, it's beyond the control of their will. They might think of a word, of a response, instantly but then realize that that's going to give them away or that or that they're uncomfortable with that response so they don't they pause and then they don't say what they were going to say and they say something else quickly or something like that right so that's why these reaction times um, are important and there's a um, sensitizing effect in other words when two or more emotional uh, words critical words that have hit the person's feeling tones in their complexes have um, arisen throughout the set of normalized words um, that then uh, the reaction time normally shoots up. So for example, if uh, the words knife appeared and the per uh, um, and that triggered the person's emotions, that they would have a slower reaction time. But then if the word spear was next uh, and spear and knife are related, they um, will show uh, a sensitizing effect where they'd even have an even longer delayed response because there's um, those associate those words are associated together categorically in the person's mind, and so the sensitizing effect shows an increase of um, emotional reaction to these particular word stimuli. So story time. So um, some examples that Jung gave in. Um, in his lecture, uh, The Symbolic Life, The Collected Works, in uh, the Tavistock Lectures, is one he gives is about a young man who was pretty well off. Uh, he got him to do the word association test, and um, he had a strong reaction time on the word knife, bottle, and lance, which is a spear. Uh, I think maybe something else, but he had a, a strong reaction time on those um those three at least. And Jung, after analyzing it, said, hey, oh, I didn't realize that you got into such a, um, you know, such a hustle or such a, uh, uh, such an engagement, such a fight with someone. And then um, the man said, well, what do you mean? Um, and, he, and then Jung said, you were drunk and you got into a fight with someone and stabbed someone with your knife. And the man said, how did you know? You know, because it was many years ago. Um, but obviously, with these three facts, the bottle, the the knife, and the spear, Jung could see that um, see a story that this man had gotten into a fight, he was drunk, and because he was he was drunk, he um, he reacted and, and stabbed someone in a fight, right? And so um, you know the story is more detailed than that, but that that pretty much is is the power of of this word association test. And the thing is, is that these people aren't conscious of they're not conscious that they are taking a long time a lot of the time. You ask them, did you take? A, how did you feel with these certain words? Um, and they say, yeah, nothing. Like they don't even realize that they took a little bit longer to answer, say, on the word knife. Or, or something like that, right? So it is unconscious a lot of the time. Um, so there's that. And then, but actually in the Q&A, because there's a Q&A at the end of the Tavistock lecture, each five lectures there's a Q&A from the doctors in the audience. And it's actually quite interesting sometimes, but a lot of the times those doctors are just pretty annoying. They're like asking annoying questions from the crowd. And, um, but one of the doctors challenged him and said, well, Obviously, a lot of this content that you're able to derive through the word association test is not unconscious. Surely, some of it would be conscious to the person. 
Um, but yeah, Jung shows like uh, how a lot of these things are actually unconscious. And I mean, I don't know, I guess that's debatable. I can see what the doctor means because I'm sure some of it is conscious, but these people are unconscious of how long they're taking to react to some of these stimuli. And so um, that's pretty interesting. So the next thing is the old man's romantic memory. So he has this man who's a bit skeptical if the word association test works. Um, he answers like five questions. Uh, five, he responds to five stimulus words and then he gives up and, you know, like he has a like a, a really resistant negative attitude towards it. And Jung's like, well, you need to do at least a hundred. And he's like, well, can you tell me anything with just these five words? And I think the words had something to do with money, heart attack, and money, health, and um, something else, right? And and so um, the man's responses themselves, the quality of the responses, not just the reaction time, but what he actually says um, in response to uh, money, I think, is something about something about France, like he, he, he uses, um, he responds with a French word or something about money, not, not his own currency. And so, and Jung puts together a few different ideas out of just the little sample size and said, and he sees a clear story that this old man is reminiscing about when he was younger and he had an affair or a love affair with a woman from France. Right, I, th I think that's right. The countries, um, and so he he says that to him, and he says that you're probably scared of having a heart attack. You want more money, um, and the old man's like, "Oh, how did you know?" You know, and so um, and Jung's like, "A child could have seen it," you know, because he because he um, pieced together all this information. So Jung was actually a very good detective in this sense as well. So it's not just the power of the association test. It's how good are you at discerning and detecting stories and patterns and inferring from what they've given you, from the responses, from how they, they stammered, from how that the quality of the, the words they used to respond, from the, the, the time they took to respond, what all that means. Um, so you have to be a pretty smart analyst to really kind of use this test as well. And then the last one was uh, the mother kills her child. So... To cut it all short, basically, um, this mum st uh, stammered on the words "angel" and some other some other words, and Jung had to really figure out what does "angel" mean to this mum, because that's the thing you have to figure out what these words specifically mean to the person. That's the key, right? And she found out that it, the an angel in this mother invoked a sense, an association of the memories of her dead child. So she, he had to really kind of like get in there with that. Uh, and basically he inferred at the end, there's a bit more to the story, but that the mother allowed the child to die um, because she knew basically that um, this certain water had typhoid or some type of disease in it, but let the baby drink it, the child drink it, and, and, and the child died. And it had something to do with her complex to do with... Um, this lover that she used to have that she didn't um, that she didn't profess her love for and then she married someone else and regretted it. So there's this complex that was unconscious that Jung could um, deduce and then draw out after the word association test by asking her more questions um, to figure out really what was going on there um, with, with her child. And he said that he debated whether he should tell her that she killed her child or not. He ended up doing that. She responded negatively emotionally, but then she was cured and she never really had these psychological issues ever again, as far as he knows. So um, she was kind of unconscious that she, why she allowed her child to drink um, the, that diseased water. And he kind of brought that to her consciousness and that seemed to fix her and settle her complexes and her anxiety. So that's all today about the word association test, the complexes, and subpersonalities. I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm going to be releasing some more videos on dream analysis, Jungian dream analysis, and um, 
we're going to get into that. So if you want to know about that, please subscribe to uh, my channel and uh, leave any comments what you thought about this video down in the comment section. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Oh.